Um, just uh, for everyone in the room and online, just for another reminder that today's seminar is being recorded. So um, if you're online, feel free to turn your um, camera off. Um, and if anyone has any issues with this being recorded, just come and have a chat to me and Nicole afterwards. Um, but hopefully that's all good. Um, I just first want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands in which we are all gathering today um, for us in the room here um, and probably for most people online, it's lands for Ngunnawal and Nambri people. And I pay my respects to their elders past and present. I want to acknowledge their ongoing cultural and spiritual connection to country and the significant contribution that they've made in caring for this um, beautiful land uh, that we have the privilege of being on um, and sharing their knowledge and culture. I extend that respect and welcome as well to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples um, joining us today, whether that be in the room, online, or those listening to the recording later on as well. Um, and um, of course, also extending that acknowledgement to the traditional custodians of the lands in which anyone who is not on Ngunnawal Nambri country um, from which you are coming from today. Um, okay, so it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Daniel Skorich. Um, he's our speaker today. Um, Dan is a lecturer in SP and a former postdoctoral fellow and lecturer in. Um, uh, in the School of Psychology at uh, UQ. Uh, Dan's research interests are broadly in the domain of social cognition and social psychology with offshoots in clinical psychology, health psychology and computational theories um, of mind. His PhD research challenged existing cognitive resource focused accounts of stereotyping and impression formation. Since completing his PhD, Dan has developed a new model of autism the Integrated Self-Categorization Model of Autism, uh, which brings together the disparate cognitive, perceptual, and social communicative aspects of autism under a single explanatory framework. His current research includes the development of a dynamic model of individual and group level face perception, a multinomial processing tree model of self-categorization uh, in the who said what paradigm, and uh, <clears throat> what will be the focus of Dan's talk today, uh, an attempt at answering the why and the how questions of consciousness. Uh, Dan is also writing a book with Dr. Ken Maver uh, called Person as Category Theory, Rethinking the Nature of the Personal Self, and I'm sure he'd be happy to uh, talk to anyone about that if, uh, if you're interested. Um, this book provides an integrated account of person and group processing across a wide variety of domains and among other things introduces a new model of impression formation and stereotype formation. So he's doing lots of incredible amazing and smart sounding things. Um, please welcome Dan today. He's going to be uh, talking to us uh, about uh, why and how are we conscious cooperation between neural signals and the emergence of consciousness as a symbolic phenotype. Okay, thank you. Um, so, as Joe mentioned, I will be talking about um, some new stuff that I've been doing on consciousness. So, as Joe said, my talk is called Why and How Are We Conscious? So, as you can see from the uh, title there, I'm going to focus more on the why question. I'll get to these two questions or what they actually are uh, more than on the how question, but I will try and address the how question at the end. Um, so, what I'm going to talk about is effectively a model that is an argument effectively by analogy. So I'm going to talk about um, a, a biological model um, of a similar, what I'm going to frame as a hard question or a hard problem in biology, and then by analogy say that it could provide some sort of solution to the same hard problem in consciousness, which I'll get to defining um, as we go through. Okay, so I will, as I said, introduce the hard problem of consciousness and break that down into two questions. So the why and the how questions. I'm going to just describe what I consider to be an equivalent hard problem in biology. 
Um, and that hard problem is around biological phenotypes. So I'm going to talk about the emergence of those biological phenotypes and then try and show by analogy how that might help us answer the why question of consciousness, so the hard problem of consciousness, and develop this idea of a symbolic phenotype. I'm then going to just go at the end, fairly complicated, but I'm going to try and speculate on the how question and then conclude with just some thoughts about uh, the future. Okay, so just to introduce the idea of consciousness and also the hard problem itself. So what I'm going to do is just get you to sort of think about the pictures that I'm going to bring up here. Um, think about the qualities that you feel that you experience when you actually look at these pictures. So this is a picture of Canberra in autumn. So you can experience the deep kind of orangeness of Canberra, the beauty, etc., of Canberra in, in autumn. If you've been to Brisbane, this is, these are some photos of Brisbane. So this is generally in the summertime. So you get summer storms. You can feel that humidity. There's a kind of a weird oniony smell that often permeates the city during that time. There's also a picture there of mangroves. So you can experience that smell of the mangroves if you know what it is in Brisbane. If you think about eating uh, Tom Yum soup, you can think about the complexity of that, of the flavors that go into that. So that experience again of, of these different flavors that are going into it. The other picture I've got there is coriander. So some of you might, as I do, experience coriander as a kind of a soapy flavor. Others experience it differently. Um, if you imagine touching a velvet curtain, so there's a kind of a velvety feel, a specific experience of that velvetiness. If you think about a toothache, so that experience of the kind of ache, the thudding, the pain in your face. And if you think about my voice, the kind of dull yet soothing monotone that you can experience as I'm talking. So all of these things are experiential qualities of these um, sort of perceptual experiences, of these per perceptual processes. So that's kind of giving us a sense of what we're, we're, when I start to talk about the hard problem, the kind of thing we're trying to explain. So it's that experience aspect of our perception. Okay, so if we define consciousness, so there are multiple definitions, but I'm going to take it to be the state of subjective awareness or experience from the point of view of a perceiver. So there's obviously a subjective aspect to it. It's from my point of view. It's intrinsic to me. I see the world as it is from this particular point of view. And a way that we can think about that is that there is something it is like to be that perceiver. So things can be from a particular point of view, but that thing itself has no sense of what it's like to be that thing. So consciousness is the state of having there be something it is like to be that thing, so to be that perceiver. So consciousness, if we kind of break it down, is typically understood to have various kind of components to it. So as being intrinsic and subjective, as I just said, so is perceivable from the point of view of the perceiver, is within the perceiver, is subjective, is unitary and irreducible. So that is, we have a conscious sort of a scene in front of us that is a unitary seen so all the aspects of it are part of a um, an irreducible or holistic kind of percept and it's multimodal and compositional so despite being a single scene there are still the different parts of it so that is the different experiences the different qualities that you can experience of that uh, irreducible um, scene so that is for example the orangeness the pain the different sound qualities etc so the key thing, though, to draw out here is that consciousness has this qualitative or what's also described as, as a phenomenological aspect to it, which appears to be distinct from its functional properties. So this is kind of starting to touch on what the hard problem is. So functionally, we can interact with the world and we interact with the world through our awareness and through our conscious um, consciousness. But it seems like those phenom phenomenological aspects of consciousness are distinct from those functional properties. It seems like at least it's conceivable that we can interact with the world without having those qualities associated with our perception. So without having that orangeness, those particular flavors, those particular sounds and so forth. And again, that's touching on what the hard problem is. So another way to think about this is that there seems to be an explanatory gap between the functional properties of consciousness and its phenomenological properties. So between the things that are going on in your brain versus, for example, the experiences, the things that you're actually experiencing, so those qualities of, of the experience. And that's what's been termed the hard problem of consciousness. So just to go back to those examples I have, there's, there's no obvious reason why those physical stimuli, when they 
come in through your senses, why they go along with those experiences. So there's no obvious reason why 600 nanometer wavelengths of light should be accompanied by the experience of orangeness, for example. There's no obvious reason why the chemical composition of tom yum soup, coriander, or Brisbane's air in summer should be accompanied by the experience of those flavors and smells. So specific experiences. Again, velvet, there's no, there's no obvious reason why it should be a velvety feel, why there should be a pain, that, that feel of a pain with a toothache, and also why the specific wavelengths of my voice should be associated with that dull monotone quality. So all of those things seem to be additional to um, just being able to discriminate between those different percepts. And if we go a little bit further into some of the philosophical aspects of this, so Chalmers has argued that an organism identical to us that can perform all the behaviours we can perform but without conscious experience is conceivable. So the idea here is that you could have some organism that can do everything we can do, so it can interact with the world in exactly the way that we do, but it does not have that phenomenal, phenomenological experience. So it's effectively like a computer that's just computing things and then interacting with the world, but it doesn't come along with those experiences. So it's what's been termed a philosophical zombie. So this is just to represent that. So you can have the same reaction to being stabbed, for example, um, where, but in one case, there might be pain associated with that. That's a phenomenological experience. A philosophical zombie, on the other hand, would not have that, would still respond in the same way to, um, to that event from the outside world. So... More specifically, Chalmers distinguishes between what he terms the easy problems, and he's not actually saying they're easy, but the relatively easy problems of consciousness. So that is the ability to discriminate, categorize, and react to environmental stimuli. Um, the integration of information via a cognitive system, the ability of a system to access and report on its own internal states, the focus of attention, and the deliberate control of behavior. So these are all things that, within the current tools of cognitive science, we can actually look into. And so these are what he would consider the easy problems. And then what he considers the hard problem of consciousness. So that is the problem of qualitative experience. So that is the problem of why there is something it's like to be conscious. So why those things go along with this conscious experience. So I'm just going to break it down into two questions. And as I kind of alluded to at the outset, I'm going to focus more on, the, on one of them than the other one, but I will touch on the second one. So the two questions really are, why are we conscious? So why do we actually get this experience? going along with our cognitive processing, and then how are we conscious? Given that we are conscious, how is it that a brain like ours can actually create those conscious experiences? So why do the functions that define the easy problems come along with conscious experience? Why is there consciousness at all? So what is it that creates that? Why would we have that? Is there some ad adaptive function to it? Is there something just intrinsic to the world that creates consciousness when you have a certain system processing um, in the way that our brains do? How are we conscious? So how is it that a system with certain properties can become conscious? And what is or are the mechanisms by which a system comes to be conscious? So that's really trying to look at the mechanisms that actually bring about something like consciousness. So as I said, I'm going to focus on the why question and then get to um, the how question towards the end, if I have time. Okay, so just to put consciousness in context and to, again, I'm going to just start to reframe that why question a little bit so that we can then start to draw on the analogy that I want to draw on. So first of all, um, consciousness as we know it. So if we just think about the consciousness that we know, that's the consciousness in ourselves. So I'm sure all of you, I'm going to assume none of you are philosophical zombies. All of you have some conscious experience. Um, and that consciousness arises within our neural systems. So the consciousness that we know arises within neural systems. And neural systems, they're there to transmit perceptual and other information via neural signals. So they're there to allow us to adaptively interact with the outside world, and then they process information effectively. So they trans transmit information, process information um, via neural signals. Um, and as we know, it's possible to transmit information without conscious experience. So computers do exactly that. So in the technical sense of, in, of information, so within information theory, information is effectively defined as a reduction in uncertainty. So in that technical sense, we know that computers, or at least we assume that computers are transmitting information without conscious experience. So then why would a system become conscious if that doesn't seem like a necessary property of information transmission? So that's another way of framing this why part of the hard problem. 
So again, to put that in that sort of context, this is an information processing or information transmission system. This is taken from Shannon's information theory. So we have an information source, so that would be like a stimulus in the environment. We have a transmitter, so that would be, say, a sensory organ or a sensory receptor. It then sends a signal. It, it's decoded by a receiver, and then a response is made. So you can imagine that this process, and we know that this process can happen without conscious experience. So if you think about a, a reflex that you have, that would happen just through this process, so without conscious experience. Well, what we get, though, is some sort of detour or at least that's how I'm going to frame it here, some kind of detour towards consciousness. So it creates a conscious experience. It doesn't seem necessary for that simple information transmission. So again, the question is, why would we have that extra bit going on of consciousness when we can do this information transmission without it? So that's the why part of the hard problem. So reframing that question, so why would neural signals go to all the trouble of creating a conscious experience in order to transmit information? So that seems like a costly thing to do, if we, especially if we think about it in adaptive terms. It seems costly to then go and create some other experience that doesn't seem necessary for the process. So this is where I'm going to start to bring in this other hard problem. So I'm central to the argument that I'm making is that there is an equivalent hard problem in biology. Now, I should say that no one in biology would consider this to be a hard problem, but I'm going to argue that it is this has the same sort of characteristics, this kind of problem, this hard problem of phenotypes, as I'm describing it. So hopefully you'll be convinced that it is somewhat the same type of problem and that it is a similar kind of hard problem. And the point in bringing this in is that there is an answer to this hard problem, and hopefully we can sort of transfer that answer from this hard problem to the one um, in, in terms of consciousness. So in this case, you can think about the hard problem of phenotypes as why would an information transmitting replicator go to all the trouble of creating a phenotype so that is a body or an organism. So I'll explain this in more detail over the next few slides, but just briefly, if you think about what is going on in, um, in biological organisms, what we start with is just replicators. So entities, molecules that just replicate themselves. So some sort of self-replicating molecule. Now you think that if such a self-replicating molecule was just making itself, making copies of itself, it would be more successful at doing that than another one that created a body in order to then create a copy of that, of that replicating entity. So there's this same idea of a kind of a, a detour. So there's a detour towards a body before you then get the replication happening. So replicators just creating themselves versus a replicator creating a body, which then creates the replicator. I'm going to show you in a few slides what in different ways how to I'm trying to conceptualize this. So this is based on um, some work by theoretical work by Maynard Smith, who suggested that you can think about biological replication in terms of information transmission in exactly the same way as in information theory in exactly the same way as I was just describing for perceptual information. So we have an information source, a transmitter, a receiver, and a destination. So in this case, it's the structure of the molecule of the replicator that is actually being transmitted. So there is the parent replicator structure. So there is the molecule of the parent replicator. It goes through certain processes, which probably originally were processes that were just chemical processes of self-replication. And then that leads to an offspring, which then um, is goes through its own developmental processes. And what you end up with in the end is another um, entity, another replicator that has the same properties as the original, as the parent replicator. So there's information being transmitted across generations. And the hard problem as I'm describing it is again this detour. So why go through this process of creating an organism that then creates the replicator? Why not just directly create the next generation of replicators? So why not transmit that information directly? Why create a body to then transmit that information? And again, why transmit information via consciousness rather than just directly? So hopefully you can start to see that there might be some overlaps. I hope I'm convincing you to some degree at least. So another way that you can frame this, and this is just to put it into a specific context. So why would a replicator go to all the trouble of making a rhinoceros in order to transmit information across generations? So rather than just replicating itself, why go to the trouble of creating this entire being that lives an entire lifetime to then just reproduce that? Um, that replicating entity. And this is actually taken from 
Dawkins, actually Richard Dawkins describes this. I think he talks about tigers. He says a similar thing. But if you think about what a tiger is, it's just a massive detour on the on a process of just replication. So replicating the genes of that tiger, just being going going, going through this massive detour. So I'm talking about in terms of a rhinoceros. So this is just to again show you this in detail. So if you imagine these two dots are just replicators. The ones on the left are just replicating themselves directly. The one on the right is creating a rhinoceros. And then that thing that's falling out of it is a second replicator. So it's not pooping. It's actually just a, another <laughs> replicator coming out. So the idea just to, that I'm trying to get your intuition going here is that in the case on the left, we're getting lots of replicators in the same time it takes to create just a second replicator. If we first go through the process of creating a rhinoceros. So in theory, there should be some cost to creating, going through that massive detour. And so the question here is why then do we make a rhinoceros and not we, but why does um, this biological process go through creating a rhinoceros to replicate? And that's where we get to the answer. And this is where I'm going to start to talk about this particular perspective. So this is the major transitions in evolution um, developed by Maynard Smith and Shaf Murray. Um, and so this is their answer to why we get phenotypes. So why do we get organisms? Why do we get this detour on the way to replication? So what they did was they set out to understand the emergence of complexity in biological systems. So they actually did kind of see it as a hard problem. They did see it as an issue. So why, why do we get this? If what we start with is just a self-replicating self -replicating molecule. And they start from that intuitive assumption that I just outlined, that any simple replicating entity that replicates itself more efficiently than rivals will come to dominate the population. So just from a starting point, you should expect that the world would be populated by lots of just self-replicating entities and very few rhinoceroses, because it just wouldn't make sense just from that starting point, that intuitive starting point, to go via that detour. But and this is effectively the answer that I'm giving you right up front, but I'm going to go through the whole argument that they make. So the argument that they make is that some replicators could actually have an advantage over other replicators if only they're able to cooperate with those other replicators. So that is, if they can come together, rather than just competing directly with each other, if they can come together, then they'll actually be better at replicating and both will actually get an advantage. There's a mutual advantage to that cooperation. So the process of going through and creating a rhinoceros is a process of overcoming competition between self-replicating entities. And what you get is a massive organism like a rhinoceros, um, and it ends up being actually a better replicator than those individuals competing with each other. And so I'll go through the whole idea, but that's the sort of the, the punchline. So the major transitions, as they describe them, are those events in evolutionary history when independent replicators overcame the competition between them and took advantage of the greater fitness of, afforded by working together. And just a little note, and I'll get there as well, for the social psychologists in the room, this is kind of a nice idea in terms of cooperation being a better thing than competition. So it's actually good from, from an adaptive point of view. So a rhinoceros, as the punchline, is a conglomerate of cooperative replicators. Okay, so these are the major transitions. So I'm not going to go through all the detail, but this is just what they describe as the major transitions in evolution. So what they suggest first is that we start with some sort of replicating entity. We don't really know what it was, some sort of replicating molecule that had some properties, chemical properties that probably meant that it could just replicate itself. Um, and then what you get is the origin of protocells. So these are those replicating entities in some sort of compartment. So that's the first thing. So they can kind of live together in some way in a compartment. Then you get the origin of the genetic code and prokaryotic cells. I'm gonna go into a lot of detail about the genetic code if I get there. So that's what I'm going to propose as a partial answer maybe to the how part of the hard problem. Um, so here what you get is cells, so different entities, different parts, different genes, different self-replicating entities actually come and start to create a phenotype here where we have a cell that has various functions going in it. They have and differentiated functions within that cell. And you also get a code. So this is a genetic code rather than just molecules replicating themselves directly. We now have actually a symbolic system of replication 
Then we get eukaryotic cells. So this came about through different prokaryotic cells actually coming together. So within a eukaryotic cell, so taking on different functions and then working together to create a more complicated cell. Then you get multicellularity. So those eukaryotic cells then start to work together to create bigger organisms. So sponges there in that case, and plants, animals, fungi. Um, and then you get eusocial animal societies. So these are, for example, bees um, um, and ants and things. So that were able to effectively create superorganisms. So go beyond just their, um, their own um, individual nature. And then the last one, which is associated with human beings. So they argue is societies with natural languages. So they put this transition down to the emergence of language. Some of you in the room might think, what about self-categorization as the thing? There is actually, I think, a good reason to think that language as a cognitive process might be the, the thing to focus on. I'm not going to go into that as to why that is, just for those of you who are social cognition people or social psych people. Um, so they suggest that this is, we get to this, our societies effectively. So working together across um, individuals who are unrelated to each other creating global kind of societies. Okay, so the key thing is that at each stage here, what they're saying is these transitions are all about overcoming co competition between different replicating entities and different units of, of, um, of evolution, different units of replication. And what they suggest, and I'll go through this in a bit more detail, is that for each of these, what you see is some sort of what they refer to as a transition in individuality. So you get you go from a particular thing like a molecule to a cell, from a particular kind of protocell to a prokaryotic cell and so forth. So you get a change in what the level the individual is. So what, what the thing that is being replicated actually is. So there's a transition in individuality across these different, um, different transitions. And what you also see is a new type of information storage use and transmission. And so information is not just passed in the same way as it was at the earlier stages, but you actually get a different type of information transition. And also alongside that are regulatory processes. So processes that regulate that information trans transmission. So these are just some examples of what those things are. So I've talked about the different transitions in, in um, individuality a little bit. So you can just see symbolic as opposed to iconic hereditary systems. So that's for the genetic code. So we go from an iconic hereditary system, so it's creating itself directly, to a more symbolic system. So it's actually an arbitrary symbol that represents some, um, in this case, amino acid, which I'll go into later. Um, and then that's how the, the hereditary system actually works and information is actually passed. So there's a difference in the way that transmission, that information is transmit, transmitted. Okay, so another aspect of this is, is is part of um, the answer to how this actually happens. So how do they overcome um, competition between them? And the reason I'm telling you about this is because, again, I want to show that there is equivalence across these two different domains, including potentially in this domain as well. So Shep Murray specifically developed um, this st stochastic corrector model. So what this model is, is a model to try and explain how competitive entities can actually end up being cooperative. So, so what conditions you need for things that are competing with each other to actually then become cooperative entities and end up transitioning to these, these higher levels of individuality. So this model shows that cooperation will be more likely if the entities, so those the replicating entities, are organized in compartments and or are not randomly distributed. And the number of entities per compartment is small. And the fitness of the collective is greater than the fitness of either entity on its own. So that's where we get the collective actually being the thing that is more adaptive, is more fit in an in a, um, adaptive sense. So just to kind of try and explain this um, as to how it occurs, and then I will show how I think this is relevant to the consciousness question as well. So if you imagine each of these dots are just um, different replicators, um, in this case, we're starting with replicators in these protocells. So if you imagine they're just replicating entities in these protocells, we start with equal numbers um, in each of the different protocells. But the, the assumption here, and this is based specifically on the example that, that um, Shatmari and Demeter give, um, the, the blue ones here actually are better at replicating themselves. So they actually will come to dominate the population 
if left on their own. So they're actually better at competing. But the assumption here is that if they can be in these compartments in equal numbers, then that entity is actually a better um, competitor than any other entity that has unequal numbers within it. So what this is trying to get at is how do we get to those entities that have the right numbers within them to actually be a better, um, a better replicator or a, a more fit um, entity. So as I said, the blue ones replicate faster. They're actually better at an individual level than the red ones. And so you see that in terms of the blue ones are dominating those populations. But then what happens is that they, they go through a process of dividing. And because there are only small numbers in those protocells, once they divide, it's likely that you'll get the optimal kind of entities arising just by chance. So it's because of that small number, small those small numbers, that we're likely to get those optimal entities, the ones that actually have just um, equal numbers of blue and red in them. And then they become the ones that are the most fit in the next generation. And then they outcompete the ones that actually have those selfish blue ones that keep replicating themselves more than the other ones. And so they then come to dominate the next generation. And you end up then, and there's been lots of computer, computer modeling of this, you end up then with those higher level entities becoming the dominant um, thing. And then this process in theory goes on where those higher level things can then come together again, and then again and again, and we end up with a rhinoceros in the end. So th this is the same sort of abstract process that's going on at each of those levels. So taking together these major transitions, and I'm drawing this out again so that I can show you that there is some equivalence in the neural system. So taken together, the major transitions are all characterized by a new type of information storage, use, or transmission. So just as examples from direct copying of molecular structure to a DNA code, as I mentioned, regulatory processes and central control. So non-coding DNA here is, is referring to DNA that does not code for pr proteins, but actually has epigenetic functions in terms of saying what should be um, expressed at any particular time. Um, so this is a, a regulatory process in that genetic, in that replication process. And then also high levels of organization and a transition in individuality. So from free protists to chloroplast mitochondria within eukary eukaryotic cells, um, from individual organisms to human society. So you can see we have this transition from lower level entities to then larger level entities that are cooperating. So why does a replicator, so the answer again to this question of why does a replicator go to all the trouble of making a rhinoceros? And that is because there's a selective advantage to cooperation if they can cooperate, if they can get there. Um, and a rhinoceros is the outcome of overcoming competition between entities at multiple levels. And then it comes to a rhinoceros is something that then comes to be adapted to the environment and to then be better at replicating itself than any of the lower level entities would have been on their own. So it's that cooperation that is the, the, the reason really why we get these higher level entities, these phenotypes. Okay, so you might be wondering what does this all have to do with consciousness? So we're gonna go back to consciousness. So as noted, the why part of the hard problem, I argue could be answered with reference to the major transitions in evolution. And so I was saying that I think it's the same kind of why problem, it's the same kind of hard problem. And to establish some equivalence, what I am saying here is that we need to show the same sorts of transitions or the same kinds of things that we see in those major transitions for biological phenotypes. So first of all, we need to see that neural signals compete within a population. So the, the starting point is competition between replicators in the biological case. Here, the information containing packets are the neural signals. So they compete with each other within a population. So we need to show that. We need to show then that there've been changes in the type of information storage use or transmission among populations of neural signals. So do they, is, is the way that they transmit information the same as it's always been from the beginning? Um, we need to show that these changes are associated with regulatory processes and central control so that we actually have these sort of feedback processes, regulation, modulation, and so forth, and not just direct information transmission. That we'd also expect to find higher levels of organization in neural activity and also a transition in individuality. And so the argument is at the end, what we should expect as the final transition in individuality is towards this integrated consciousness. So that is the final 
kind of integrated rhinoceros in the case of conscious of um, information processing in neural systems. And the last thing that we'd want to show is that the stochastic corrector model is relevant at least to neural systems. So that something like that could play out in terms of overcoming that competition between neural signals. So I'm going to go through each of those things to try and show that there is some equivalence across um, these two questions. So the first question is, do neural signals compete? So if we look at the evolutionary history of um, sense organs, what we find is that they evolve relatively independently within the same organisms. So we have ones that are um, responding, for example, to light. So just to light and dark, for example, others that are responding to chemicals within, say, the, the water, or others that are responding to vibrations, so effectively like sound waves. So different sort of sense organs that are relatively independent. So what you expect from that is that there's some sort of competition then between those different um, different modalities as a starting point. So each of those organs then produces signals, which then produce actions. If we look back to the original history of this or the very early history of this, what you find is that those signals immediately create actions. So that's where we get sort of reflex actions. So as soon as there's darkness, for example, over a light sensing organ, then like a clam will close just as a reflex. So there's just a kind of a direct um, sensation to action kind of process. Importantly though, the signals can occur simultaneously within the same organism. So that is already the start of suggesting there is some competition. So in response, for example, to simultaneous external stimuli and therefore compete to produce the organism's primary response. So we have competition between these signals that needs to be overcome if, if these signals are going to be as adaptive as they can be. So you can imagine that having the ability to adaptively respond to different types of sensations is going to be better than just responding to the one that has the strongest signal from the outset. So there's some sort of competition there. So this is just an example. If, if there's an eagle attacking you and you see it and then you hear a shark coming, there's some sort of competition between those things that needs to be overcome. And also neural signals themselves have intrinsic properties that can make them better or worse at producing a response. So for example, if we think about this as just a binary kind of um, signal, so ones and zeros, one, one, zero, zero, so this is like a temporal code in a temporal neural code, uh, is a simpler code to produce and therefore would be able to be produced more efficiently than a code that's much longer. So you can imagine if something is being coded with something short versus something that's coded with something long, the one that's shorter is just going to win out by being a shorter code. But a shorter code is also more susceptible to noise than is a longer code. So if any of those ones or zeros change, that changes the meaning of that code more than it does for a longer code. And so again, that would then suggest that the longer code is actually one that is, um, is more competitive in that, in that particular case. So the idea here again is that we have some sort of competition within um, the neural system. If you look also at research on brain activity in general, most brain activity is stochastic. So it's effectively random. And then there's random sort of spikes of different things going on that are not completely related to the outside world. And it's been suggested that this is also some process by which you end up with different si signals becoming the ones that produce action in the end. Okay, so that's competition. So the next question is, do we see new forms of information storage transmission or use in neural systems? So in biological systems, as I noted, we see a transition from direct replication to the genetic code as an example. So that's what this is representing. So direct replication to DNA, and this is actually the um, genetic code. In neural systems, similarly, we actually see an equivalent transition from direct stimulus response organs to neural coding in the form of symbolic arbitrary action potentials. So what this is supposed to represent, so this here is a, an early sense organ where you get some sort of external stimulus that hits the organ that immediately produces some response, some signal effectively, but that signal just directly causes some action. So this is a reflex arc, for example. It just, the, the strength of the signal is what then causes the specific strength of the actual action. So that's a direct kind of thing. There's no coding in between. It's just a direct action. What we end up with is actually some sort of coding. So action potentials are some sort of code. So it codes for particular things that are symbolic. And when I say they're symbolic, that means that they have no 
um, particular relation in their structure to the things that they're coding for. So we get the same thing in, in this genetic code as we do in neural systems. So action potentials are symbolic codes as opposed to what you might think of as iconic codes. Another thing that we can point to, which I just think is interesting, is language, which is something that only human beings seemingly can do, is a new form of information use and transmission. So if we look at the history of this, it's about 200,000 to between 200,000 and 80,000 years ago, potentially, and this is one suggestion, but there are other suggestions as to how this may have occurred, but there is a what's been termed merge operation that just takes two components, puts them together and combines them into a set. And then that allows for hierarchical embedding of concepts without limit, which then allows recursive thinking. That allows us to actually construct sentences. It allows us to, to process much more complicated concepts than we could if we were just using the initial atomic concepts that we have. So we have this additional cognitive system that is allowing us to hierarchically embed um, information. And also then we can transmit that information as I'm doing to you now by, um, by speaking, so by using my dull, monotonous voice to transmit that information across individuals in space and time. Okay, so the next question is, do we see regulatory processes and central control in neural systems? So if we look at DNA, only about 1% of DNA codes directly for proteins. Approximately 80% regulates gene expression and particularly during embryology. So that's a complicated process of gene expression during that process of embryology. About 80% of that of the genome is, is related to um, gene expression. So not is related to regulation, gene regulation, as opposed to the direct coding of proteins. We see something similar in the neural system. So it's been estimated that up to 90% of neural connections are feedback. So that is regulatory or modulatory and 10% of feed forward. So that is carrying information directly. So from sense organs to the central nervous system particularly. So 90% seems to be regulatory and 10% feed forward, so information carrying. So that's quite similar. Um, these are just examples of some of these regulatory processes. So inhibitory interneurons, neuro neuromodulatory systems, including dopamine, dopamine serotonin, acetylcholine systems, um, the thalamus, and then these particular circuits, which are involved in self-monitoring and also in consciousness specifically. So we see these regulatory processes in the brain that are regulating these neural signals in the same way that we see um, regulation of gene expression in the genome. Okay, what about higher levels of organization in neural coding or high levels in the neural system? First, the first thing to note is that the neural, the nervous system is hierarchically organized. So we have a central nervous system and a peripheral nervous system. We also can say, or this is a bit more controversial, but we have different modules that do different things. So that's a hierarchical organization. So for example, a language module, potentially a moral reasoning module, different modules that are doing different things that are hierarchically organized as well. So there's hierarchical organization in that sense. But in terms of the signals themselves, they don't just carry um, information at the level of action potentials. What you see is that synchronized populations of neurons transmit information over and above that transmitted by individual neurons. So un to understand what the information being, processed, being transmitted is, you can't just look at individual neurons, though they do also transmit specific information. You also need to look at populations of synchronous activity to then understand what the, the information transmitted actually is. And at a higher level still, you get large scale neural oscillations that provide additional information over and above neural populations. So these are brain wide oscillations, oscillatory activity, which also seems to provide particular information. And there's a theory within the consciousness space. So the global neuronal workspace theory that suggests that consciousness arises from global integration of neural signals and subsequent ignition of a brain wide workspace. So they're suggesting that this workspace is something that is brain wide and that is that, again, this level of sort of the highest level of individuality. And that's similar to what I'm suggesting here is that consciousness is that um, integrated higher level um, of individuality beyond that, those individual um, neural signals. And the last part here of create or arguing for this um, equivalence is just to say, is this stochastic corrector model applicable to neural systems? So as mentioned, the stochastic corrector model shows that cooperation will be more likely 
if the entities are organized in compartments and or they're not randomly distributed. Um, the number of entity, entities per compartment is small. The fitness of the collective is greater than the fitness of either entity on its own. In this case, the entities that we're talking about are the information carrying signals. So previously we were talking about replicating molecules. Here we're talking about information carrying signals. Signals are not organized into compartments. So we don't have something like a cell that carries signals but they are actually non-randomly distributed in the neural system. I probably should have said earlier that one of the um, ideas about the early history of life was not that they were in these compartments of protocells, but that they were in the, that these replicators were actually across surfaces. And being across the surface means that you don't have this 3D structure. That means there's complete randomness of your connections with others. You have some sort of connections across that surface. And this is more like what I'm going to say for the neural system. So the non-randomly distributed neural system. So you can see this in recent research on nematodes. So the connectome was recently mapped in its entirety. And this revealed that the neural system was a so-called small world network. So a small world network, just to give its definition there, is a mathematical graph in which most nodes are not neighbors of any given node, but the neighbors of any given node are likely to be neighbors of each other. Don't worry about exactly what that definition is, but the key thing is that it's non-random. So here we have a random network. So there's random connections. That's not what you find in the neural system. What you find is this small world network. So it's a network where there's non-randomness. And that gives us something similar to having these different compartments. So that suggests that the signals are actually connected to each other in particular ways that would allow them to then um, come together and cooperate in that similar way. So all I've done here is just to change it from compartments to connections, but the, the same principle applies. So I'm not gonna go into detail here, but here we have optimal networks. And so this is where you can get lower level entities. So these signals coming together within optimal kind of networks, but then those networks themselves can then integrate with other networks as well, based on, again, this small world um, graph property that they have. So where they're non-randomly distributed relative to each other, and you end up with a higher level of organization as well. So the question then is, does this give us some um, confidence in saying that maybe there is some sort of major set of major transitions towards consciousness? So there appears to be some equivalence between these two questions in terms of Neural signals compete within populations. There have been changes in the type of information storage use or transmission among populations of neural signals. These changes are associated with regulatory processes and central control. There's high levels of organization and also the stochastic corrector model appears to be relevant to neural systems. So it, the argument that I guess I'd be making is that there's a selective advantage to cooperation between neural signals. And conscious experience is the outcome of overcoming competition between signals at multiple levels. So consciousness, you can think of as a symbolic phenotype. So we start again with that same idea of just information being transmitted. It could be transmitted directly, but if those different signals, which transmit different types of information could integrate with one another, then we can end up with something that is even better at doing that and even more adaptive for the organism than if those neural signals were working in competition with each other. And the idea here is that the eventual outcome of this is consciousness, so some sort of symbolic phenotype, so something that is like a rhinoceros. So just to say that, so emergent from overcoming competition, so this is rhinoceros and conscious experience, composed of hierarchically organized subsystems, we potentially have also a distinction between a genotype and a phenotype. So the genotype here is the genes that code for particular amino acids and then allow us to create um, proteins. And then there's a process of embryology that creates the phenotype. It's not really thought about in this way in, in um, neuroscience, but some of the signals could in fact be similar. So these signals that we're getting are not actually just transmitting information directly, but through these regulatory processes might be creating something else. So an emergent kind of property. So something like a phenotype, so something like consciousness or what I've sort of termed there a phenomenotype. So phenomenology, a phenotype of phenomenology. And there might be something equivalent to like embryology. So where it's, there's a system of, of rules that, that lead to the creation of something like consciousness. <clears throat> 
And the last part is just to say that the function of the subcomponents can only be understood in context. Um, I've pretty much run out of time. I'm just going to finish up by telling you what I'm suggesting the symbolic phenotype is. The last part of this was about the how question. If you have questions about the how question, it is quite complicated, but I can um, answer those questions or we can have a chat some other time. So what is the phenotype of conscious experience? So what I'm arguing is that it is an information system that creates a representation of the perceptual world that has those properties that define consciousness, obviously. So it's intrinsic and subjective. So that is the sentient perceiver is the decoder or the reader of that perceptual representation, which only exists from their own point of view. So that's part of this symbolic phenotype is something that is the decoder of that information. It's unitary and irreducible. So the represent representation is holistic and integrated via embryological or syntactic rules of composition. So we see this in language, there are syntactic rules that put together bits of information, but the idea here is that we'd also be putting together bits of information um, to create a holistic representation, a conscious representation, and it's multimodal and compositional. So these qualia, so these are the qualities of experience, I'm arguing here are the symbols being read by the decoder. So qualia, what we think of as our specific experiences, so orangeness, redness, um, those feelings of uh, toothache or whatever, each of those things can be thought of as themselves as being symbols. And they're symbols that are understood by the reader, which is the sentient perceiver. So the question for the, the how question is a process, a plausible process by which such a phenotype could arise. So getting this reader that can read these more abstract, non-physically instantiated symbols. And that's where I was going to go, but I don't have time to do it. Um, there's a lot here about genetics and so forth. So I'll leave it at that. But if you have any questions about that, we can talk about it some other time. Hi, um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, very interesting. Um, are, you, are you familiar with uh, Bronco and Ginsburg's work on the evolution of the sense of soul? Uh, no. Okay, so they, they also have a framework for um, uh, trying to explain consciousness uh, in the framework of like these kind of major transitions. Um, and their thing is like, there's an analogy, it's kind of like a strategy, but there are analogies between like, um, uh, life as being like uh, something that's emerging from open ended uh, heredity, uh, and then consciousness as something that's uh, emerging from like open ended learning. So that could be helpful. Actually, no, I do know, I do know what you're talking about. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, Maybe just the model in case anyone online. Yeah, sorry, what was the name? Is it Chabonka and Ginsburg? Chabonka and Ginsburg have a model um, that is looking at um, trying to understand consciousness as the outcome of sort of of, of learning effectively. Um, so it also takes this approach of major transitions. Um, yeah, I, I do know of that work. I don't know it in, in detail. So I think that's something that's interesting for me to look at as well. Yeah, because it seems like your approaches are really similar. And I, I would be interested to know, like, how yours uh, differ from theirs. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, uh, could you go back to the how slide? Yeah, so, uh, so uh, I, I am from a philosophy background. Uh, so this stuff is, really interesting, but uh, it's not terribly clear that those features of consciousness are uncontroversial. Uh, so, so for example, like unit and unitary, right? Uh, an octopus uh, perceives the world mainly through the neurons on its uh, arms. So like, it may not be unitary. And I, I guess a more general uh, thought uh, is like, what the sentient perceiver I don't know if you're being literal or metaphorical about it, but it kind of gives off kind of this sense of there being like a Cartesian theater, um, which, uh, so like you're the kind of like, there's some little person in your brain kind of like reading off all the kind of 
perceptions that you have, and that's kind of controversial. So I guess like I guess it's just kind of a comment like, are you uh, how literal are you taking this kind of uh, this kind of language? And like uh, yeah, like I, I'm not sure if that really affects your account. It might just be semantics. Yeah, no, that's a good question. So the first question was just about um, whether these. Uh, properties of consciousness are uncontroversial. Um, what I would say is, first of all, that I'm trying to focus mostly on, on where we know there is consciousness, which is in human beings. So it's very hard to say, do we really know that an octopus is conscious? I'm not sure. I mean, I, I would be open to the idea that they might be. So this really is trying to sort of describe, I guess, within human beings, what we'd expect. And within human beings, these do seem to be general properties that we would see in, in human consciousness. Um, a lot of these, or these are taken effectively from integrated information theory as, as a particular view of um, these particular, as they call them, axioms. Um, they're not uncontroversial either, obviously. Um, in terms of the, your second question, so the sentient perceiver, is that just a Cartesian theatre idea? So obviously, um, I think that's a, a good um, critique. What I'm saying here is not that there is some perceiver looking at things. It's more trying to talk about it in that same sort of information um, information theory kind of language, that there is some sort of decoder. It just happens that we, the thing that we see as the sentient perceiver, is that decoder. What I was going to try and get to was that the symbols that the decoder is using are these abstract symbols that are within the system and that only exist within the system. And that's the, the whole how part. Um, so it would be about thinking about the sentient perceiver just as a decoder, a decoder in, the, in the sense of information theory, something that has access to what that code actually is and is able to interpret that code and then to construct things with that code to, to use algorithms associated with that code and so forth. And in the case of human beings, obviously, there's an extra layer, which is also then, you know, there's a, a perception of our own consciousness as well, which then adds some something extra to that. So I think that's obviously it's a it's an important critique, but I'm not saying that literally in the sense that there is some homunculus in the brain that's just watching something. So more just in an information theory sense. I think it would make more sense if I had, had if I'd been able to get to the how part. Yeah, one more quick question. What's the Thanks. Um, that was really interesting and really stretched my brain. I don't know anything about this space. Um, but I come from an anthropological background, and I, so I guess I have a, a one of my questions that comes up for you. And I love this thing, it's fantastic. One of my questions is I'm, I'm wondering if you're perceiving of information as neutral. Um, because what we do, particularly in sort of critical anthropology, is, is really question the kind of the assumption of neutrality in science. But, and I'm, I'm wondering. Um, what your thoughts around the you know, use of this concept of of information? And I think it follows on from the previous question: like, is is are we just is the information coming into it neutral, and then are just seeding of that? Is that foundational to your theory? So, at the level at which I was describing, sort of information processing system in in information theory, information is just literally about the, the reduction of uncertainty. So if there's some um, expectation about what a message could be, and then you actually get some message, and then that reduces your uncertainty about what some state of the world, then that means some information has been processed. So at that level, there's something relatively neutral about that. At the level of obviously our conscious experience, um, there's lots of influences obviously on the way that we interpret that information the way that that information is transmitted through culture and so forth and i think then you, you're getting into a different space where that information is obviously not neutral at all um great and that uh, brings us to the end of the seminar um Next week, we have uh, two fantastic talks planned uh, from uh, Dr. Kristen Murray and Dr. Lillian Smythe. So please come along next week as well. Um, and if you want to brave the, the wet weather, please join us for drinks at Badger as well. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.